I guess we're ready. So, um, welcome to an app talk. You might have wondered about the name because it's not very clever, but there's obviously a story because apt is an adjective, but apt is also short for advanced package tool. And how could you call it? You could s spell it apt. You could just pronounce it as the word apt. But it's also confusing because there's also a command called app now, which you really should try because it's a bit easier and it has nice progress reporting and stuff. A lot of people don't know about it, but try it out. It's nice. And this is an app talk because it's about apt, and apt is part of Debian, so hence the name app, an app talk. But let's talk about more important stuff. And the first one is actually BSD porting, because I figured portability is a great way to um, ensure that stuff works and to find bugs in software. And we use continuous integration for testing apps regularly. And particularly, we use Travis, which is a free service available on GitHub. And it only supports Windows, Linux, and uh, Mac OS. And I don't really have a Mac. I initially had a port of app to FreeBSD, but it's someone requests at some point and stopped working. But I could get it working on the Mac with help on the IRC channel. So I just provided some patches and other users tested it and compiled it and reported back, oh, test suit now runs. That was nice, but it's not really done yet and it's missing a lot of functions on the Mac, especially the one in POSIX 2008. So the whole add family is mostly missing. And we're using more functions now, so it's even request, request more than it used to. But that's not really an interesting thing to talk about. And a much more interesting topic is unattended upgrading. And yes, <laughs> we did a lot of work on that. And it started with a cron shop in 1.2.10, or before 1.2.10, it was a cron shop that ran daily, and a cron shop, a daily cron shop runs, I think, at between 6 and 7 in the morning. And we had a random sleep of 30 minutes, which um, helped uh, to distribute the load on the mirrors. So you don't want all machines updating at the same time, because then the mirror just you know, explodes. But that was not enough for everyone, especially some Ubuntu Cloud mirrors were a bit overloaded. <laughs> so what we did in 1.2.10 was we switched from a cron job to a system D timer. And the system D timer ran at two times during the day, at 6 and in the morning and 6 in the evening. But we added a random delay or of 12 hours. So basically, it ran any time during the day, but it ran twice during the day. And we had a check inside the script, which made sure that it only updated if, it, if 24 hours had passed. And the whole thing was persistent, so the timer was restarted at boot and at resume if it should have run in while the machine was off. And we still have a cron shop, so there's still a compatibility to wrapper for systems that do not use systemd, because obviously we don't want to break them. And there are a few problems with this. First of all, it runs at any time during the day, and that's fine for downloading, really, but not for upgrading, because, well, if your database upgrades during the day, and it stops accepting connections, then your site breaks down for some time, or if the database gets corrupted or something, it's just completely broken until you fix it. And you don't want to have that during business hours where you actually rely on your service being available. And another problem is 
that the service starting at boot and resume doesn't wait for a network because we did not have a dependency on networking. So we improved that a bit in 1.4.1, 1.4.2, 1.4.3, 0 0.5, and 0.6. So you see it took quite a few iterations to get this right. Basically, we broke the timeline two timers. One for did the updating, and the other did upgrading and cleanup of lists and packages and stuff. And we made the update job run throughout the day, randomly as the job before. But the upgrade job now became running <coughs> Now was running at uh, 6 and to 7 a.m. Actually, 6 a.m. plus or minus one hour, and that way it was reliable again. So the upgrades always happen at the same time. But there's a problem with that as well because <laughs> when the update runs, because the update is distributed over 24 hours, the upgrade could, if you have multiple machines, the upgrade could install different upgrades on different machines. And that's not entirely optimal, but I think it's the best we can get. <laughs> and the timer, we made the timer depend on the network online target. So the network online target is a target that basically depends on various helpers for network managing services like Network Manager Wait Online and System D Network D Wait Online. And it started at boot and waits until the network is available. But that doesn't really work as because it only helps at boot. It doesn't work at resume because, as I said, the target only starts when you're booting, and then it is started, and the dependency is satisfied, and it won't wait anymore at resume. So what we can do about this is we can build a script on our own, which basically just checks which network managers are running, and then just says, calls the uh, wait online helpers of these network managers, but that's not done yet and will come later. And another alternative we had was uh, to build our own online waiting helper that just uh, tries hosts in the sources list file until it connects to one and just tries that for 30 minutes or so. But that's even more complicated, so I guess we'll start with the whole um, wait online helper running in the script to at least get it right a bit. Another thing, this is very recent, is HTTPS support, which I rewrote. So in 2006, we had a curl-based HTTPS method, and this was completely separate from the HTTP method. It had no pipelining support. It had no support for using HTTPS proxies in HTTP requests. I don't think HTTPS proxies are very common, but I guess you should support them. It's getting even more important these days, I think. And, well, that was not optimal, so this year, I think last month or so, I rewrote HTTPS support and I basically just added a compatibility layer to uh, the HTTP method. So now you can use HTTPS support in the HTTP method, it's installed by default, and it's basically just one tiny wrapper around a socket, so it's completely transparent if you use HTTPS on HTTP. It's the same code apart from calling a few TLS functions. If something broke, please tell us, because obviously we can't check all configurations. Um, oops. Yeah, stop using apt key. Why? Of course, uh, in Stretch, we uh, deprecated apt key, basically, because we did not want to have uh, GBG installed all the time on small systems, because it has a lot of dependencies, for like the uh, agent, the GBG agent, and stuff. But a lot of features in apt key required, so it has a list command, which shows you keys and key rings. And these, this only works if you have GBG installed. And in Stretch, we demoted uh, the dependency on GBG to uh, recommends, which 
normally means it's installed by default, but that actually doesn't work because apt is installed by the bootstrap, and that does not install recommends. So you might not have GPG installed on, you, on current systems. And mm -hmm. now it's a suggest, so it's not going to be installed in even more cases, I think. And previously, people installed new keys basically by using apt-key add or apt-key advanced, the advanced mode with receive keys on key servers, which is or was a bit dangerous because GPG doesn't really or didn't really check uh, key IDs if they were if the key matched the key ID you requested. So, um, what you should do instead is uh, drop a keyring into a GPG file in the trusted.gpg.d directory, which you can do since squeeze. Or, alternatively, if you only need to support stretch and newer versions, you can use ASCII armored files as well. Just name them .asc and it will work. And you can use GPG export to generate the files. And previously, people used GPG keyring, but GPG keyring switched the format in GPG 2.1, I think, to keybox f format. And that's not compatible, so you get completely weird errors that you can't find keyring keys, and everything just breaks down, which is not really optimal. Oh, you asked why I didn't make AppKey drop the file? Yeah. And, well, we should do that eventually, but we can't identify uh, key rings um, because the old key rings, they don't have magic header, so they, you can't really identify if they are GPG key rings or not. But we can at least check if a file is a key box and then drop the key box. <laughs> okay, why? Why? Because Apt-Key is no longer installed. Well, now it's not the key, it's the battery. Just keep talking for a Is it on? Yes. Yes? Okay. So. I know now it's too late, but what I'm trying to say is it would have been nice for everything that was using app key if app key had been changed to now that you have to put the file in the directory, have app key do that for you so that you didn't have to change the things that were using app key. Does this yeah. make sense? I know uh, now it's too late. Now we have already changed all our tools, but I'm asking like why why wasn't this considered? Well, the, I think one of the problems is how do you name the file you're putting the key in? So if you have, if you don't have GBG, you c can't know the key ID, and then you don't have a name. You could pick a random name or a UID or a hash or something, but that's not really optimal. And you have to get duplicate keys, um, and you. Don't you need to validate the <laughs> key? Uh, how do you do that if this GPG node is not installed? We don't validate the key at all. <laughs> we just concatenate the files together, and then we run GPG V on it when we're verifying something. <laughs> the small version of GPG that just can verify stuff. <laughs> Let's. Talk about something else. <laughs> yeah, in 1.4, obviously the most important feature is that Moo is now reproducible. You can use the source data part thing. <laughs> and of course, SHA1 is now completely untrusted. But if you need to use SHA1 a bit, so uh, I think we uh, made. And I'm not entirely sure which part of the SHA1 we made untrusted, but there's an option for you to make it weak again. Then it only warns that there's an SHA1 signature and no SHA2 signature instead of erroring out. So you can revert to the previous behavior. 
And in 1.5, we introduced a new feature that checks if values in release files change, like the code name or the, uh, well, the other fields related to the release. So if the release changed, you install stable, and you name your source list entry stable, and it's a new stable now, it will ask you, hey, do you want to upgrade to this new stable, basically? And we also documented the auth.conf format, which is basically netrc for apt. I don't know if it's actually um, released yet, but if not, it will happen later today. And I think that's it. If any more questions, like, please ask. Um, uh, thank you for your talk and your work on the app. It's uh, really appreciated. And I especially appreciate the switch from app get to plain apt. Uh, it's just amazing to say four keystrokes and that a command that I use all the time like that. So thank yeah. you very much. Um, regarding that, one problem I have now is I am constantly typing things like apt policy and apt random whatever that I that fail because I need to use apt cache or apt get or like there's still some things that are not in the uh, just apt command. I think most of these should actually work at the moment. So app policy works, for example. Okay. So if I find one like that that annoys me, I can file a bug against it? Yeah. Woohoo! Hello. Hello? 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 Is it working? <laughs> hello? Yeah. Um, hello, Julien. Uh, thank you for the talk. And one problem I have is when uh, I add a multi arc uh, foreign architecture, yep. then the, with the arc call packages, you get different versions, and then there's some uh, uninstallability yep. issues. Uh, could we, or are you thinking or, or working on uh, using the binary arc call? Packages file that FTP master is providing, and try to not use the R call versions from the binary architecture. I'm not yeah. sure if we want to do that, but we probably could do that. Okay, so. But it's not nothing I really work on, so. Okay, this is not in the roadmap then. Or no, I, I, it's not in my roadmap. Okay. <laughs> So if, if that is not on your roadmap, what is on the roadmap? So what are the <laughs> next things that we can see or wait in APT or apt? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think more sandboxing features for the download method and maybe reworked sandboxing. So currently, you need to make files available for the underscore app user, like your netrc file, which is actually fixed now. And uh, keys, if you use private keys with the um, HTTPS support, then you need to make those readable for the underscore app user. And it would be nicer to just open the files as root and then pass them to the uh, protected method so you don't need to make them available to the app user in general. That improves things a bit, I think. There are probably other stuff on the roadmap, but I can't remember all of it. <laughs> I, I forgot what my real question was. Um, <laughs> so I use unattended upgrades regularly on um, most servers I deploy, and I think that's great that it's there, and it's working very well in general, especially in the later versions. What my problem is when I need to upgrade uh, 250 servers between major releases, I end up doing constantly the same things over and over again. I need to use all sorts of tricks and tools and various devices to automate that thing, those things. And I was wondering if uh, people on the Debian side were working on things like what Ubuntu is doing with the do-release upgrade uh, script and things like that. And if we can work together on a solution that would allow uh, some automation uh, for major releases, and if that was on the roadmap for you. 
I think it would be nice to have something like that. But we don't have a plan for that currently. <laughs> but I also have the idea of uh, having some weak uh, conflicts or something, then you could just do the removals of packages, say this package is obsolete and remove that if you want to. That would be nice as a first step maybe. You could have a meta package, release upgrade or something at the install and then it just automatically removes all old stuff. Okay, I think we're done. Thanks for coming.